The season of Lent is always a journey, a journey with Jesus as he travels the road to Jerusalem. Jerusalem where the magnificent, glorious events of Holy Week and Easter will take place. And as we travel with Jesus on that journey here at St. Paul's, uh, we are considering it kind of a road trip. And like any good traveler does, we're putting together a playlist for the road trip. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I'm going on a road trip, there is certain music uh, that just stands out as songs for the road. Uh, for me in particular, I think of the Eagles' Peaceful, Easy Feeling, or U2's Joshua Tree album, or lately, uh, Jimmy Buffett's Changes in Latitudes, Changes in Attitudes. Because, yeah, if we couldn't laugh, we would all go insane. <laughs> but what about you? When you think about songs for the road, what, what songs come to mind for you? What do you think about? On the road again. <laughs> Willie Nelson, right? Yeah. Tom what else? Petty. Tom Petty. Tom Petty. <laughs> Good old Gainesville boy, traveling music there. Yeah. Uh, in, first, uh, in the first service, somebody said, hit the road, Jack. Uh, <laughs> not sure if he was saying uh, that or, uh, about the song or talking to me, but... <laughs> But songs for the road are important. And when we talk about this particular trip that we're on, this, uh, this journey with Jesus to Jerusalem and to the cross, there's actually already a playlist put together. That playlist is called the Songs of Ascent. Like I said last week, it was a collection of songs that were made for pilgrims who were traveling up to Jerusalem for the high holy days, for the great festivals. And they would sing these songs together as they traveled in groups, as they ventured up to the holy city. And we know these songs as Psalms 120 through 134 in the Bible. Now, for those who seek to travel with Christ and travel the way of faith in Christ, we also find something in these songs. We find that they actually incorporate a whole lot of different elements of faithful Christian discipleship. So they provide for us a way to remember, to remember who we are and to remember where we are going. Now last week we looked at Psalm 120. And the first thing we talked about was the need for what? The need to repent. I'm glad you're all paying attention. <laughs> the need to repent, to turn around. After all, if you're not going in the right direction, it's awfully hard to get to your destination, isn't it? But another thing that often keeps us from getting to our destination is when we break down. Because when we break down, we often need a little help, right? And help is what we're talking about today as we look at Psalm 124, which is one of my favorite psalms because it starts off with a call and response for the people of Israel to give a shout out to God. It says, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. 
It's a wonderful affirmation, but it's a constant refrain that we hear all throughout the Psalms, but especially in this songbook that we call the Songs of Ascent. It is a wonderful affirmation, not just that God loves us and God helps us, but also that what is really incredible here is that the creator of the universe is linked intimately with the Father who knows his children by name, who knows us personally, who numbers the very hairs on our head. This one verse takes the majesty of the one who pulled the galaxies into order and made them beautiful. And it finds that very same God involved in the day in, day out details and struggles of an ordinary person. One year I took a retreat at Lake Junaluska and I decided to look for a different kind of worship experience on a Sunday morning and boy did I ever find it. I ended up at this place called Jubilee Community in Asheville. Has anybody ever been to Jubilee Community? Uh, it, it is not like any church that I have ever seen before. Now, they're like us a, a lot in that it is a church that welcomes everyone, no matter what. And they have all kinds of people at their church. And also like us, they sometimes enjoy blurring those artificial lines between sacred and secular in, in the songs that they use in worship. But that's pretty much where the similarities end. They are distinctively non-traditional. And because they're this kind of quirky church, they, they attract a lot of artists. And they encourage those artists to put their, their talents to use in worship. And on the day I was there, they had a photographer who, who gave an exhibition entitled The Extraordinary in the Ordinary. And it was a, a collection of pictures of incredibly pedestrian things, doorways, dogs, uh, weeds sprouting from the sidewalk, uh, stones in a creek, uh, things that you don't normally think of as necessarily being all that beautiful. And yet, each of these things were shown in her photographs to be incredibly beautiful. The beauty was brought out when they were enlarged by the zoom lens of her camera. Items that are, are, are small and insignificant were blown up to the size of a whole wall in, in the sanctuary. And everyone there could see what we tend to overlook in our day-to-day -day routine. Carefully planned details that produce exquisite beauty. In particular, the one I remember was a photograph of a doorknob. A doorknob, for heaven's sake. I mean, I mean, think about that. How often do you stop while opening a door to admire the beauty of a doorknob, right? And yet here it was, the, the, the copper uh, on the doorknob turning to beautiful patinas of blue and green, a filigree that had been delicately fashioned by a metalsmith. Light, barely discernible, coming through the keyhole, offering the hope of something beyond the door. What we often assume is not worth looking at twice is, at closer look, a magnificent labor of love. That's what's happening in the 124th Psalm. It magnifies items in life. In this case, it magnifies unpleasant things, like the struggles of life, the jaws of monsters, the raging rivers that, that wash over us, the traps laid for us. But it finds in these things a magnificent labor of love, specifically God's love. You know, in our life, we tend to go to our, our doctors and to our shrinks to find relief from what is troubling us. If we want beauty, we go to visit an art museum or we take a walk out on the beach. Yet, what we see in this song is a disciple who digs down deeply 
and, and to the troubles of life, to entrapment and suffering and even disaster, and finds in those things a God who is on our side. In the details of those conflicts, the greatness, the majesty of God is revealed. And what we learn is that a beautiful faith develops out of the most difficult things in life, not out of the easiest. A faithful disciple is fashioned not as much by a life of ease and comfort, of prosperity and indulgence, but by being involved in the deep struggles of life, by grappling with the ugliness of sin, our own and the sins of others, looking up to the heavens that that may inspire a a breathtaking sense of awe and, and wonder. It may even cause us to sing a song of praise to the God who made the heavens and the earth. But this song actually looks in the other direction. It looks into the the troubles of our world, the anxiety of interpersonal conflict, the emotional train wrecks of life. And a close look at these things with the zoom lens of faith reveals something, reveals something oddly beautiful. It reveals the redeeming action of our God. As followers of this God, we sing the praises of heaven in a world that is sometimes hellish. We sing songs of victory even in the midst of great, great loss. We are not just scraping by in the dark alleys of the world. No, we are finding an abundance of grace when the light is focused upon the darkness. Because it is the Christ who lives within us and not the culture around us that defines our lives. It is the help we experience and not the troubles that we encounter that form us as disciples. Now, Christian discipleship is hazardous work. I applied for a life insurance policy one time, and when I did, a nurse came out to the house to conduct a a physical and to ask me the underwriting questions. And she's sitting there filling out the, um, uh, the application form, and she looks up and says, do you engage in hazardous work? To which I replied, oh yeah. (laughs) And she looked up at me over her glasses and said, I don't mean that kind of hazardous. And really, I'm not implying that my particular work as a pastor is necessarily any more dangerous or hazardous than what all of you do every day. I just mean that the work that we share in common, the vocation of a disciple of Jesus Christ is hazardous because each and every day we put our faith on the line. In a world where everyone wants proof, they want things that are, are quantified, measured, and examined, we insist on making the center of our lives a God who no eye has seen nor ear heard. I have no idea exactly what the future holds. Before this day is done, I may have to deal with <coughs> death or pain or, or, or loss. And yet, I openly declare that my faith is in the Lord, the Lord who made heaven and earth, and that nothing, nothing can separate me from His love. Each and every day, God's love is laid on the line. And in spite of my tendency to look after myself first, I open my heart up to God, and I deal with the frustrations of trying to love others more than myself. Daring to believe that falling short in love is still far better than succeeding in self-importance. All that is hazardous work because you know what? All the time I live on the edge of defeat. I know that as St. Paul says, faith, hope, and love abide. But you know, I have never been able to do well at any one of those things. Not as well as I would have liked. 
I, I, I teeter, like the psalmist says, on the lips of a monster that would swallow me up whole, on the edge of the flood that would carry me away, if not for the help of God. And that, that is the focus of this incredible song for the road. It's, it's God's help. It isn't the hazardous conditions. The hazardous conditions of life are, are, are just the, the setting where the song occurs. But it's God's help that's the focus. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Hazards or no hazards, the fundamental reality of the way we live is the God who is on our side. The God in whose strong name we find our help. In living our lives with God, Christians travel the same ground that everyone else travels. We breathe the same air. We drink the same water. We pay the same prices for groceries and gas. We fear the same dangers. We're buried in the same ground. The difference is this. With each and every step we take, with each breath that we breathe, we know that we are protected by God that God walks with us, that God rules over us. Therefore, no matter what, no matter what dangers or accidents or traps we come across, no matter what doubts of our own that we endure, the Lord will guard us. He will guard our hearts and our lives. Because deep, deep down, we know the truth of that great hymn by Martin Luther that, that we started off with this morning. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed His truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for Him. His rage we can endure, for lo, His doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. As followers of the one named by that little word, as followers of Christ, we believe that life it, it is created, that it's given, that, that it's shaped and formed by God, and that the life of faith is a daily adventure of the countless ways in which God's grace and God's love are experienced at work in our lives. As we sing Psalm 124 on the road along with Jesus, it spells out the conditions under which we live out our discipleship. And remember, those conditions are defined first and foremost not by the hazards, but by God's ever-present help. Once we get this song in our hearts and it becomes a part of us, it will be unthinkable that being a Christian means some unending battle against ominous forces that uh, might break through at any moment and overcome us. Faith is not a precarious game of chance, dodging devils and bad guys. It is the solid, massive, secure experience of God who keeps all evil from getting inside of us, who guards us against the floods and the traps and the monsters, and who watches us over us now and abides with us always. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, we look to God who made heaven and earth, who is our life, who is our salvation. We realize that there are things with which we all need help but realize that God's power can overcome them all. Where in your life have people set traps for you? What are the waters that are threatening to wash over your head?
What are the monsters threatening to swallow you up? They may seem big, larger than life, but they are never, ever bigger than the God we serve. Give those things to God now in prayer and meditation. And as we pray and meditate, I invite you to come forward to the cross if you choose. There are slips of paper in the basket along with pens. If you want, you can write down those things with which you need God's help. Write them down and then fold the paper and then just place it in the cross, giving it over to God. I invite you to come as we pray and meditate.